Since 2002, ATI have been dominating the graphics card race over its rival Nvidia, with one top performing flagship after another. 2004 was no exception, and so long as speed was your biggest concern, Nvidia was left in the dust. But one area ATI didn't compete as well in was features. Nvidia had already moved on to Shader Model 3.0, a big advancement over 2.0, and the one poised to carry real-time graphics to the next generation, both in PCs and consoles. By comparison, ATI seemed to be resting on its laurels with only minor enhancements to the existing Shader Model 2.0 standard, called 2.0B, which saw very little developer support. By June 2005, NVIDIA was already on its second generation of Shader Model 3.0 hardware, the G4 7800 GTX, while the world still waited for the day when ATI would follow suit, finally revealing what they could do with the latest shader standard. As it turns out, they weren't resting on their laurels, they were just waiting to get it right. Nearly four months later, ATI had their response, the Radeon X1800 XT, and the stage was finally set for battle on equal footing. This is Pixel Pipes. Pixel Pipes is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Check out our newly launched Pixel Pipes store, where you'll find lots of official merch, including our new Maximum Rage tee, tailor-made for fans of obscure and highly flawed retro hardware. Click the link in the description below and help support the content you enjoy here at Pixel Pipes. The G4 7800 GTX could be described as an evolution of its predecessor, the 6800 Ultra. If you haven't seen it already, do check out my video going into detail on the 7800 GTX architecture and features. Just as a quick recap though, Nvidia sought to enhance what they believed to be the biggest strengths of the G4 6 architecture, its powerful pixel shading engine, and the wide number of pixel pipes in its design. The G4 7 series was simply more and greater in both regards, with only minor tweaks elsewhere and efficiency and a couple novel new features for anti-aliasing and HD video playback, only some of which wound up being exclusive to the new line. But one thing that became very apparent with the 7800 GTX was its relatively anemic core and memory clocks, which helped it fit very comfortably within the heat dissipation limits of its slim single slot cooling solution. The low profile design was almost a declaration to its adversaries that, yes, we are in fact holding back. But show your belly to the enemy, and you can expect to get gorged. ATI had no problem moving in for the kill, and when they announced the X1800 XT in October 2005, it was clear from the large blower fan and uncharacteristically long PCB that they weren't messing around. Whereas Nvidia opted for a low power 110 nanometer manufacturing process, which they had already tested and refined with mainstream G4 6 chipsets, ATI jumped in with both feet into a brand new 90 nanometer low K process, which was optimized for low power leakage at high clock frequencies. This was a risk as ATI hadn't yet had a chance to familiarize themselves with the new process, and here they were using it for their top of the line GPU. This might account for the lengthy wait time on its launch, but the end product was none the poorer for it. Clocked at 625 MHz on its core and 1500 MHz effective for its memory, it blew the doors off the 7800 GTX in terms of frequencies. On top of which, the card launched with 512 MB of GDDR3 memory as standard, twice the amount that Nvidia had. 256 MB was still largely adequate in 2005, and ATI would eventually release a variant with 256 megs for a lower price, but it was clear that 512 megabytes was the way to go for future games. At $549, the X1800 XT also slightly undercut the 7800 GTX's price of $599. But what, besides high clocks and a big frame buffer, did that money get you? 
The R520 GPU on which it was based was no small iteration over the previous few generations. In order to accommodate the new Shader Model 3.0 standard, every part of the architecture was modified and upgraded. With enhanced vertex shaders with flow control and improved pixel shaders with full support for higher precision 32-bit floating point operations. The biggest upgrade, however, and the secret sauce, so to say, of the R500 family was the ultra-threading dispatch processor. This is essentially the precursor for what would ultimately become the warp scheduler for modern-day unified shader architectures. While this early version focused on pixel shading programs only, it had intelligence built in for handling dynamic thread scheduling of instructions, allowing the GPU to avoid stalls in running shader code. It could also better handle one of the more forward-looking features of Shader Model 3.0, dynamic branching. As shader code was expected to get more complex, branching code was a problem that GPUs would eventually need to tackle, and ATI was ready for it. With the ability to juggle 512 threads at once, each only 16 pixels wide, the ultra-threading processor could perform loops and context switches on the fly with fine granularity. Comparatively, NVIDIA's G70 GPU had no elegant way to handle more complex branching code. It lacked any sort of sophisticated scheduling hardware, and its thread size, or batch size as it's sometimes known, was a whopping 1,024 pixels. A missed branch while executing code meant the entire pipeline was stalled for multiple cycles while it waited to flush the data. To be fair, this wouldn't be an issue for the vast majority of games being played within these cards' lifetimes. By the time Shader Model 3.0 would be used to its fullest, much faster hardware from both companies would be available, and NVIDIA would have time to address how its later architectures would handle sophisticated instructions. For the simpler games of 2005 and 6, NVIDIA instead relied on raw power to see them through, and those 24 pixel pipes still had a potential advantage over ATI. That's because the Radeon X1800 XT only came equipped with 16 pipes, a disappointing figure given the X800 series shared the same amount. They did upgrade the number of vertex shaders from 6 to 8, and with the architectural improvements and raw clock speed advantage, they were hoping the X1800 XT would steer them to victory. If you look at the theoretical performance numbers, you can see that the X1800 XT does have a considerable advantage in pixel fill rate and vertex processing, but the 7800 GTX edges it out in texture fill rate, and its shaders have a considerable advantage in floating point operations. For ATI to win this one, they'll have to rely on the efficiency of their shader engine rather than brute force. There is one other thing though. As I mentioned in my previous video on the 7800 GTX, while NVIDIA packed more texture units and shader pipes into the GPU, half the shader throughput was effectively given up whenever texturing had to be done. ATI, as with past architectures, could perform texturing and full speed pixel shading simultaneously. Then there was ATI's brand new memory controller, the Ring Bus. You see, in lieu of any real major advantage in memory bandwidth, ATI decided instead to tackle memory efficiency and cache misses to improve performance. In a traditional memory controller setup, a GPU will have each controller connected via 32 or 64-bit channels directly to each bank of memory, often shown in pairs like this one. A ring bus is far more complex, connecting each channel not just to memory, but to each other, as well as linking together each separate bank of cache. These channels become ring stops, and whenever a data request is made, the relevant data can be fetched from any cache or memory bank and carried around the ring to where it's needed, avoiding a costly miss. ATI often marketed the ring bus as a 512-bit interface, but this was only true internally within the GPU, as externally it was still just a 256-bit memory interface. Memory bandwidth isn't as effective this way, but latency can improve dramatically with such a setup, which ATI viewed as the more important aspect for the future of game engines, and perhaps even beyond that, should the GPU ever become useful for things besides just games. In essence, ATI was playing the long game.
and you have what is shaping up to be a very interesting match between a very forward looking but leaner architecture versus a beefier but more legacy driven design. The only thing left is to see which one prevails and so that's what we're going to do next. Here at Pixel Pipes, we intentionally use overpowered CPUs and newer but not always the newest drivers which are more mature and perform better than what was available at the time of launch in order to get as close to each graphics card's true potential performance as possible. Please check the video description for test system details. First up, we have 3 Mark 3 a very early showing for DirectX 9, and as such, it spends much of its time leveraging DirectX 8, with only one of its game simulations dedicated to DX9. The X1800 XT shows a slight lead here, but it's really nothing to write home about. 3 Mark 5 is much more up to the level of these cards, with the X1800 XT widening its lead to a much more respectable 28%. But what's much more interesting is how they do with Shader Model 3.0, 3 Mark 6 dedicates two out of its four tests to it. The margins tighten up quite a bit with only about 11% separating the two, but ATI's card still isn't losing. Halo is another early DirectX 9 showcase, but can scale very well with shader performance, and we can see there's barely a sliver of light between these two, with only 3% separating them in average frame rates. Unlike Halo, Far Cry allows us to switch on anti-aliasing, and we see a clear lead for the Radeon when it and an isotropic filtering are enabled. It gets a 28% improvement in this case, while leaving those features off brings the two much closer together. Half-Life 2 barely stresses these cards at this resolution when AA and AF are disabled, nudging close to the 300 FPS limit of the Source engine. With AA and AF on, the X1800 XT's lead widens to 18%, but the 1% lows are even higher with a 28% better result. Doom 3 shows NVIDIA being much more competitive, but interestingly, the Radeon still edges it out ever so slightly. With AA and AF enabled, however, it's a different story, with a huge 44% lead for ATI in average FPS and 36% better in 1% lows. Serious Sam 2 hugely favors ATI, and it's outright brutal here for the 7800 GTX. With AA and AF enabled, the X1800 XT gets marginally better performance than the GTX without them enabled. Just ouch. Fear is a little easier on Team Green, with very close performance without AA and AF, and even slightly better 1% lows. With AA and AF, however, the X1800 XT performs 34% faster, making for a noticeably better gameplay experience. And then of course, we had to load up Crisis for Torture Test, and at medium settings, 1024 by 768 the X1800 XT gets 17% better performance just on the edge of what is playable in this game, which is really how most people experienced it back in the day. On average, the Radeon's advantage isn't too great without AA and AF, but with them grows to around 30%, which definitely would have made an impact on the games people played at the time, especially the 1% lows. So in the end, ATI set out to beat the 7800 GTX, and they succeeded. In every game I tested, the X1800 XT wins, which is quite remarkable given some of the disadvantages it has in its specs. The effort to improve efficiency definitely bore out here. But on the practical side of things, if noise was a concern for you, you wouldn't have wanted the X1800 XT. And that's still true now for retro builds. In terms of their availability on the secondhand market, I wouldn't call them plentiful, but I still wouldn't overpay for one. You shouldn't have to spend more than $30 for a standard X1800 XT, in my opinion. The 7800 GTX is a lot quieter and frees up more space in your expansion bay. They're also more plentiful and can be had fairly cheaply. Feature-wise, they're mostly equivalent to each other, although there are a couple of differences. The X1000 series can display floating point HDR lighting and anti-aliasing simultaneously, which the G46 and 7 series can't. This point needs a little more clarification, so let's just pause it here for a moment. 
It's true there are situations where the 7800 GTX and all derived G70 or even previous generation NV40 based GPUs can support multi-sampling anti-aliasing alongside HDR lighting. This could almost be a video in itself, but to keep things simple, it actually depends entirely on the type of HDR lighting implemented by the game. A game like Far Cry with patch 1.3 or newer uses 16-bit per channel floating point color data for its HDR rendering. This means when performing MSAA, a GPU needs to be able to support MSAA on a floating point render target. You can get around this, of course, using a different method, and that's exactly what Valve's Source Engine did in 2005 with the launch of the Half-Life 2 Lost Coast demo. HDR is done through integer color data using a separate bloom shader to add the over brightening effect to simulate what the floating point method would give you. While not what the purist might consider true HDR, this does mean that even Shader Model 2.0 hardware could implement Source Engine's HDR and all supported GPUs could enable MSAA on top of it. I admit, since I'm not a programmer, my understanding on this is limited, and so that's all I want to say on that for now, but in the meantime, that hopefully provides enough context, clarification, and caveats on this complex issue for most of you watching. Anyway, back to our regularly scheduled programming. But the GeForce's support Vertex texture fetching for producing nifty displacement map effects such as in water, though you probably won't be using them in a game with that feature. When it comes to multi-GPU support, NVIDIA's SLI is a lot easier to set up since you can pair any two cards, and SLI bridges aren't hard to find. ATI's Crossfire during this time was a headache, requiring Crossfire Edition Master Cards and a special external display dongle which is difficult to find now. But speed-wise, there was no beating the X1800 XT, at least until November when NVIDIA brought out the big guns and doubled the size of the memory, and the size of the cooler. That's when they really got serious. But that's a whole nother story. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, keep it locked to this channel for many more videos like it coming in the future. Thanks for watching, I'm Nathan, and this has been Pixel Pipes.